Good, good evening, everybody. This is Mary Peabody with UVM Extension and the uh, New Farmer Program. And tonight we are talking about farm safety for the growing season. And our presenter tonight is Alex Jump, who is the farm safety educator with UVM Extension Agribility Project. So, Alex, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Mary. Okay. And what? And welcome to the webinar. I'll be presenting a guide in the form of a checklist to where safety issues might be on your farm. The areas presented are general, and a more complete listing can be found at the end of the presentation. There will also be some photos that show real safety issues, and you'll be asked if you can spot the issue. Some are easier than others to spot. There are also some photos that show safe ways around some of these issues. So a quick overview. We're going to talk about where you work, environmental factors, pests and other nasties, farm visitors, children on the farm. Now, I've been showing some pictures of a tractor and a dog. And can anybody figure out what the safety issue is here? And a multiple choice is coming up. Looking at this picture of the tractor, can Mary, can you figure out what the safety issue is? I'm looking. I'm thinking, um, let's see, I'm thinking, um, I don't have a clue other than nope. maybe. Well, I'll give you multiple guess. OK. And that might prompt something. Here we go. A. Dog is driving tractor. He has not taken the tractor safety course. B, <laughs> the dog is not wearing a seatbelt. Or C, the ROPS has been modified. What do you think? Is there an all of the above? Um, I would say A. You know, if I had a dog that could drive a tractor, I think that that would be pretty cool. So you're going to say A. Actually, it's the ROPS that's been modified. It's about half the height that it should be. So uh -huh. the rollover protection structure, ROPS, has been modified, um, perhaps so that the tractor can fit into the barn. Sometimes um, that happens. The problem is that the driver can only be as tall as the dog for the ROPS to actually protect him or her, and the driver should be wearing a seatbelt. So yeah, I guess you know maybe the problem is the dog. But the ROPS is too short on this one. So now we're going to go to where you work. And um, I'd be interested in, there's the general farmstead. And that's um, similar to this picture here, where you have all the different buildings, the ponds and the pastures. Farm buildings, shop, crop and feed storage areas, livestock facilities, tractors and machinery areas, greenhouses, farm stands, and sugar houses. And I'm sure that there are other things that can be on your farm that I haven't put up there yet, but I'd, I'd be interested to know what kind of areas people are working on as new farmers. So we're going to start with the first bit, the general farmhouse, the farm stand. And here's a farmhouse that's been in the process of being refurbished. They're getting rid of the junk by putting it in a dumpster instead of burning it or just leaving it in a junk pile, as opposed to this. The dangers lurking in this pile include poisons, rat habitat, combustibles like oil, recent paints, old batteries, just to name a few. The safety issues here are pretty clear cut, but the farmer didn't want to get rid of anything due to a theory that there might be something useful in the pile. And Matt Myers, who is our ROPS <laughs> coordinator, said that that wheelbarrow could be used. So there is something valuable in that pile. But the issue is actually hoarding, which can be a symptom of mental illness. And sometimes we see that on farms around here. So in the general farmstead, depending on your operation, you may or may not have visitors or customers coming to your farm. So things you want to think about are fenced-in play areas for children, designated places to park tractors and equipment, buildings and outdoor work areas that are well lit, ponds, lagoons, or manure pits fenced off, junk piles are cleaned up, and limited access signs posted if you choose to have farm visitors. So now we're going to talk about farm buildings. And this is a type of barn that has a second story entrance for hay. And this is the same barn after the accident. And what you see here is a tractor 
Um, he was pulling hay and bringing it into the barn. Um, he managed to survive this accident. He had driven the tractor up the ramp many times before, but knowing of the possible dangers, he actually forbid his family from doing it. He said he would be the only one doing it because it was somewhat dangerous. He was pinned under the tractor and suffered only minor injuries. Um, and he thought it was safe enough for him to do it, and he just wanted to get that last load in before the end of the day. And the lesson here is that sometimes we know that a structure might not be in the best shape and we take that risk. And in this case, he was really lucky because he was pinned right under that tractor as, he, as uh, it went down. Oh my gosh, that's scary. Yeah, they're great pictures. Um, and this is a round to it problem. So <laughs> there seems to be more tasks and time in a farm. This wiring was a project that the farmer knew was an issue, but had it on the I'll get round to it tomorrow list. And after a farm safety visit, the project was put on the doing it today list and it was completed. So the issues here in this picture, you have live wires that are uncapped and they happen to be next to a metal pipe. And right above this particular electrical outlet um, is the hayloft. So any kind of uh, arc and power could create a spark um, and that could ignite the entire building. So in farm buildings, what we're looking for are, are there telephones or cell phone reception or walkie-talkies located in each of the buildings? Uh, are there emergency contact numbers posted? Fire extinguishers and first aid boxes? Electrical wiring? Is it in good condition? And of course, is the building structurally sound? So the farm building checklist is available at the end of this presentation. It's a step-by-step -step guide. There's seven pages with approximately 10 to 14 uh, questions. Uh, so you can do your own assessment. It's also available on the UVM Extension website. Shops and storage. And this is where we talk about corrosives, explosives, and combustibles. So in this shop, there's a whole variety of different things going on. And corrosives are anything that causes oxidation, acids and alkaloids, such as battery acid or lye or quick lime used to break down animal tissue. Salt is another type of corrosive. If it can rust something, then it's corrosive to one degree or another. The explosives are gases, welding tanks, fuels. And combustibles are paper, sawdust, anything that can ignite. Greasy rags that you have in your shop should be kept in a metal container with a lid so that if there's a spark, they don't catch. So that's a pretty neat, pretty neat shop, as this one's pretty neat too, but there's an issue with this one. Um, this shop storage space is used uh, for a variety of items, mostly tack for horses. However, what doesn't belong in there? Mary, can you figure it out? Um, boy, I'm not doing very well at my quizzes tonight. Um, that's OK. They're, they're tricky. Let's see. What's the what's the big metal thing leaning against the wall? Oh, that'd be a rock. That would should be, that a be on the tractor. Is that it? Ex yeah, it should be on the tractor. Exactly. So the problem is that the ROPS is in the storage area, not on the tractor. And what's interesting about this picture is see how long it is, and the picture of the dog sitting on the tractor. Ah. There's a middle bar, and that's where they had cut the ROPS off in the picture with the dog. So Got look it. at how long this ROPS is compared to, uh, compared to the one that was on the green tractor. So they really cut off almost two feet of the ROPS. So don't do that is the take home message. Don't do that. That's the take home message, exactly. And here's another shop. And um, Kurt and I tried to count how many explosive, corrosive, corrosive and, and uh, ignitables there were, and we kind of stopped at about 50. Um, it has all sorts of hazards. You've got a, a battery um, sitting there, battery acid. You've got lots of sharp metal things. You've got a welder in there with um, a combustible box on top of it. Power tools kind of left aside, and, and this is his actual workshop. So um, this would be an area that I would say would be pretty good to, if you could clean it up, it might be a safe step. So shops and storage to review, are they clean? Do they have good ventilation? Can the shop be locked to prevent children and unauthorized people from entering? And take a look at the corrosives, explosives, and combustibles. Keep battery acids, fuels, oily rags, or papers away from welding areas and heaters. 
crops and feed storage. And so here is a great example. These are organic oats, and they are stored in metal containers with lids. And that keeps the little critters out compared to this. So barn cats love feed bags. Um, uh. They love feed bags because that's where the mice hang out. And so that's a, that's a place that you would probably find a cat if they can get in there. And they're great for keeping the birds and the rodent populations down. But cats can also carry uh, a disease called toxoplasmosis, which can be transferred to livestock and humans. And toxoplasmosis is a disease that's dangerous to pregnant women, folks with poor immune systems, and it can cause abortions in sheep and goats. So you have to really weigh how important those barn cats are and uh, make sure that they are going to the vet so that you can keep an eye to make sure they don't have diseases that can be transferred is, to us. Is there a vaccine for this or not? I don't know, but there is a wonderful toxoplasmosis fact sheet uh -huh. that is at the end of the thing. And you can learn much more, probably more than you ever wanted to know about toxoplasmosis. Um, so let me just break in here for a second and, and let folks know that at the end of this, um, the recording of this tonight's session, as well as the presentation and all these fact sheets that we're referencing, are available at the uh, New Farmer website and will also be available at the uh, the Farm Safety website as well. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for reminding me of where they're going to be. Sometimes I don't get it quite right. Um, this next slide is a little bit flat, sad. This is Andrew Wheeler. Um, he died April 26 this past year. And he was an 11-year-old student um, over in northern New Hampshire. And um, he was in critical condition for a while. Um, Claremont police said that Wheeler was on the farm with a relative who works there when the accident happened. He was seen riding his bike near a silage crib on a working dairy farm before the accident. So again, when you're talking about feed and storage of feed, um, a major storage area is a bunker for uh, sawdust or a bunker for silage. And um, when you get to this time of the year and the silage has been taken out all winter, um, if it's not taken out, from the top to the bottom, the top can become very heavy and can topple down. And um, so the problem is that, that Andrew was riding his bike around. He had been on the farm before. And um, he, he got too close to the silage area and um, was smothered underneath the grain silage. So that is a very sober reminder of keeping areas safe. Yes, it is. So we should say one, even one accident is one too many, which is why we do these site two programs. Absolutely. So crop and storage areas, again, can the entrances to feed and grain storage be locked? Are children prohibited from playing in grain bitch and silage bunkers? Are storage areas dry and drying areas free of trash and other fire hazards? And are permanent ladders attached securely and in good condition? And again, this, this complete checklist you can get at the end of the webinar. So now we're going to go to livestock facilities. And this is a really nice setup here. Um, expectant mothers and older lambs are in the middle. And new mothers and new lambs are penned on either side. And you can see them behind the green pens from side to side. Those are green metal gates that can slide up and down, and you can move them around. And then there's a creep for lambs. And that's an area where it's a little nursery, where the little lambs can get in, but the mothers can't. And notice, if you can, way in the back, they have um, a space fenced off with larger red pens for the black Angus. Um, it's a nice barn. It's got great light, and it's got good ventilation. And they've separated out uh, the animals into appropriate spaces. So it's, it's safer for the animals, and it's safer for the farmer as well. And then sometimes we see areas that aren't so picked up. And the tin behind this merino sheep um, is from a temporary shelter that the farmers had constructed. And it was blown off over the winter. And then the tin was buried under the snow. And alongside of this tin were, were boards with nails sticking up. And the tin, of course, has really sharp edges. So if you have animals that are around um, sharp, sharp edges and tin, then uh, it's, it's possible that they can um, be cut and get infections. But also, um, if you're out there working with the animals, um, you can be looking at the alpaca or the goat or the sheep, and you can trip or fall and, and hurt yourself as well. So keeping your areas picked up is really critical. And then I love this picture. Um, so <laughs> I think that's probably the the best 
uh, door fence opening I've seen. Um, but the problem is, is that uh, the, the fencing, you can barely see it. It's a mesh fencing, which is pretty good. But uh, anybody that has ruminants knows that as soon as the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, as it, as it is starting to get in that picture, then the animals are going to bust out. So it's a great photograph of a door. But unfortunately, um, it's not really secure in terms of keeping the animals where you want to keep them. And then we have a chicken-friendly coop. And um, this is a good example of, of good ventilation, good light. Uh, the chickens have nice round roosts um, to accommodate their curved feet. Uh, they have an above-ground entrance in the back with a door that slides down. So this is a weasel-proof uh, chicken coop. And happy chickens make good eggs. So livestock facilities. Are fences sturdy and well maintained? Are the children prohibited from playing in barns or pens? Are vents and fans in good repair? Is the shelter appropriate for the animals? Do you have a designated petting area for certain animals? And now tractors and machineries. OK, Mary, you're going to get this one. What is the safety issue here? <laughs> I know you can get this. I'll give you a hint. Oh, Alex. <laughs> we've, talked about I think I do. we've talked about the safety issue on several other slides. OK, well, let's see. Well, the tractor has got a ROPS on it. Does it? It does. It looks, well, it looks like it. There are two tractors. Oh, I see. Uh, the one in the middle, the little, the little the one little between board. the cement mixer and the uh, road roller, or whatever it is. That's right. The missing the, one. I know it's hard. You know, it's it's hard to spot the rocks sometimes. Um, but what I really like about this picture is that it's a great example of parking your machinery where it needs to be parked together, open space, really good visibility. These are where the machines are. It's very easy if you're on a farm to have your equipment in one place and good visibility all around so you can see when you're pulling out if there's anybody there or any animals there. So um, he gets an A minus because I love that they're all parked there. I love that it's open, uh, but he doesn't have a ROPS on his blue tractor. So the key is here to teach them when they're young. And so this is Carson, and he lives on a dairy farm, and he loves to help out, but he knows the rules around the tractor. So what you can do at your home if you've got kids, um, and you should do it with, with your farm workers or, or, or do it with people you're farming with, is work out clear hand signals for when somebody can safely approach you on the tractor. So for example, if you have your hands, both hands straight out like you're flying, then that signal might be it's safe to come near. So if both hands are off the levers, it's pretty hard to drop the bucket. Carson knows the stop sign is used by his family, and it tells him to stay put. But the problem is, is what if dad does not see him? So can you count on your five-year-old for knowing what to do? So children should never ride with you on a tractor, unless you have one of those really huge, huge tractors that has a buddy seat with a seat belt inside. So there are some tractors that can ride two people. Um, they're really huge. I haven't seen too many here in Vermont. But for the most part, children should never ride with you in the tractor on your seat on the lap. They are never to ride in a bucket or on the fender, or they shouldn't be allowed uh, without supervision in a working tractor. You can't see them if you're busy moving bales or cutting hay. Huh. And hydraulic fluid is, um, is one of the things that people have tractors, and, and uh, they're surprised to find out that hydraulic fluid is very, very poisonous. Um, and if an accident occurs, you have to see the doctor right away. And uh, any fluid that's injected into the skin, it has to be surgically removed. You can't, if you get hydraulic fluid in your skin, you can't just go and wash it off with soap and water. And um, it can cause gangrene very, very quickly. And not all doctors are familiar with this type of injury. So if you go to the doctor and you say, I've been squirted with hydraulic fluid, make sure they look up how to treat it, because it needs to be surgically um, removed. And hydraulic fluid, when, it, when the tractor is working, it's under pressure. And so a tiny little pinprick can um, have a stream of this stuff coming up, and it can, it can 
cut you very, very, very easily. And some people who have had that happen, they feel almost like a little bee sting. And they look down and they don't really see anything, but maybe some fluid on the outside and they brush it off and they don't realize that, that the hydraulic fluid has actually gotten under their skin. But it's a very dangerous situation. And uh, part of the problem is that hoses on tractors tend to get old and they tend to break. And they will most likely break when you least want it to happen, when you're busy using your tractor and when uh, the supply store is closed. So it might be a good idea to have a couple extra hoses in your shop just in case you need to change one after hours and the shop is, and the store is closed. That does seem to be the issue with equipment breaking. And I actually remember that very exact thing happened to my father. Um, years ago, and I remember until the day he died, he had a little black stain under his skin where that hydraulic fluid, I think, was not properly removed. Pro probably not, but he's lucky that he, he didn't lose. Yeah, sounds like anything. he was very lucky. So now we're going to talk about PTO, which is power takeoff. I call it pull the tractor off. Um, the power take, the powertrain takeoff, or PTOs, uh, generally have a box that covers the moving part on the tractor, although with older tractors, sometimes they're removed. Um, and then there's a shaft that connects it to the machinery of the tractor. And that shaft rotates at a most commonly 540 RPM or rotations per minute. And that's so fast that you can't humanly react fast enough if your clothes get caught. So if your clothes get caught, you're generally pulled in with it. Um, and so having a cover on it is really the only safe way to go. And this poor thing caught up in the PTO shaft, you see his arm is all wrapped around, is a stuffed dummy. So it's not a real not a real person. Um, somebody who gets caught in a PTO, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of damage, and it's a it's not a pretty sight. So to review tractors and machinery, have operators been trained on the equipment? Is there a no extra rider policy on the farm? Do tractors have ROPS and PTO cover shields? And before you start work on your machine, conduct a walk around and an, inspe an inspection prior to working the machinery. Environmental factors. OK, Mary, this is an easy one. What's wrong <laughs> with this picture? <laughs> OK, I'm going to guess that there is no rocks on this tractor. You're so close. He's got a rock, but it's folded in half. <laughs> Okay, that was a trick question. Alex. It was a trick question. <laughs> it was it was a very trick question. So here you have these bicyclists, right? And and they're biking. They're on the correct side of the road. They got their little helmets on. You know, they're having a beautiful Vermont day. And then you got this guy. Now, what he's doing is correct in terms of the environmental factors because he's got his hat on. So he's got some shade from the sun and he's got long sleeves on. So I'm happy with his his clothing pick. So that's and we great. hope he has one of those big old slow moving vehicles. Indeed, we hope the back. we hope he does. Um, and Matt was quick to tell me earlier today that a majority of tractor accidents happen on highways. And so, no, he's shaking his head. He's actually here in the room with me. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. I got my facts wrong. Twenty percent of tractor accidents happen on the highway. So. Hopefully this guy made it to the end of the road without a problem. But he had folded these little black things. He's got a sm like a smokestack. And then on either side of the smokestack, one on his right shoulder, one on his left, he has um, the black bars of the ROPS. But some ROPS, some newer ROPS, you can actually fold in half, which is fine if you put them back up. But this gentleman didn't. He probably thought he knew better. So personal protection equipment, PPE. So wearing the right clothes for the job is important as any other safety step. So gloves, headphones, or earbuds. And that funny looking black and yellow container that looks like a gumball machine is actually an earbud dispenser. Those are those little foam things that you can put in your ears and, and then uh, they're disposable. Masks for when you have air contaminants, dust. Uh, safety suits if you are working with pesticides, and of course, a good pair of work boots, um, particularly if you're doing um, activities where uh, you value your toes. So chainsaw, you want to have good work boots, steel toe. Uh, so wear the right clothes for the right environment. 
So air contaminants, uh, they can come from grains and feeds as well as from chemicals like pesticides or even something as simple as dust from the field or lime. And notice Mary, he has a slow moving tractor emblem, but, but no doesn't rot. Rots. But no rot. You got it. Matt has his work cut out for him. Yes, he does. He's he's got he's he's trying to, to get me to tell him who all these farmers are without their rops. So water and summer storms, and I didn't know this, but on average, did you know that Vermont has one tornado a year? Did, did not you know, know that. that? Isn't that an, interest, that. an interesting little fact? So uh, May tenth, two thousand nine, so about a year ago, the National Weather Service confirmed a tornado that touched down in Washington, Vermont. And it reached winds uh, over 100 miles an hour, uh, doing damage to apartment roofs, snapped large trees, and destroyed a barn. So here's the thing. Check the weather before you go out. And if a summer storm is coming and there's lightning, it's never safe to be out there, particularly if you're sitting on a metal tractor. Not a great idea. So if it's thunder and lightning, get out, take cover, um, and leave the job for when the weather's better. And don't take cover under a tree. And don't take cover under a tree. That's right. Um, environmental factors. So again, personal protective equipment, PPE, for eyes, ears, gloves, masks, shoes, clothing. Sun exposure. Um, I didn't put a slide up, um, but just a reminder that um, sun cancer, um, skin cancer from sun, um, is something that we have to deal with here. Air contaminants, um, they're all over the place in the farm, so you have to be mindful. Uh, air contaminants, you find them in a chicken coop that's not well ventilated, in any barn that's not ventilated well, up in the hayloft, and you can uh, develop sensitivities to that. Um, and in terms of water and summer storms, um, it's always good to know uh, if you're by a river or a creek or a dam, you're going to want to know what the safest route, out, route is to get out in case there is a flash flood. So continuing to be grim, let's talk about pests and other nasties. So um, this, is, this is a hot topic around here. Um, Black-legged or deer ticks transmit Lyme disease and have been found in Shelburne. And about a month ago, uh, they were positively found in Cambridge. And you can go to the vermonthealth.gov to find more resources. Um, they have fact sheets, and there is a great little tick fact sheet on the UVM extension site as well. Um, there are lots of other insects uh, that can cause trouble from bees to black flies and paper wasps. Cluster flies are a nuisance to human as well as livestock, and dealing with them, sometimes the pesticides are just as dangerous if not used correctly. So pesticide safety tips. This should be a no-brainer, but should should be something that we remind uh, that we're we're reminded of every year. Always read the label before buying or using pesticides. Use pesticides only for the purpose listed in the manner directed. Keep children and pets away from pesticides in areas where pesticides have been applied. And you know you want to think about if it's really windy, it might not be a good day to use the pesticides. Boot scrubs. So look for a disinfectant and a vericide that makes it effective against viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And I use one called, here at Extension, I use one called Viricon S. It comes in a powder, and you can pre-mix it. And Gempler's carries it. Um, the other piece about it is that cute or black, it doesn't matter, as long as they are rubber. Boot scrubs will ruin leather boots, so keep your farm boots on your farm. So you'll probably need a nice sturdy pair with steel toes for some jobs and for other jobs, rubber boots. Diseases are spread from farm to farm by contaminated boots. Orf or sore mouth that you find in sheep is one of them. So uh, there are different types of scrubs. Uh, I go on farms a lot, so I use the one that has the triple protection, the antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral. Now, Alex, they also make um, disposable Boots, yes, they right. Do. Don't they? That you can, they, if you're visiting a lot of farms or if you're going on a farm tour. Yep, they do. They have plastic booties that you can put on. You can buy a box of 100 plastic booties, fairly inexpensive. The issue is that the booties are one size fits all, so they tend to be big. And um, I am a bit of a spaz, so when I wear plastic boots in slippery mud, I fall. So ah. I would rather wear rubber boots with grips and scrub them. 
um, and have them fit me correctly than than the plastic booties. Although that's a that's a personal call. Um, you might want to have if you have a lot of visitors on your farm, you might want to um, have a box of of plastic boots because some visitors might not have rubber boots and might not want to use a scrub on their leather cloth ah, or shoes. Point, yeah, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up about the plastic boots. So picks and pokes, and we're going to wind down here. Um, sharps are what we call needles that we, we use with our animals. And um, you need to dispose of them correctly. So a labeled biohazard box is really the best way to go. And most vets will take them and will dispose of the needles properly. I believe my vet has them incinerated. Um, the problem with this other Coke Zero can dispenser, I mean, it's a very clever idea to have this needle, this, this uh, sharps um, container that you can put it in. My concern is that a kid isn't going to know what's in there, but they're going to know what a Coke can looks like. And so um, you can teach them easier about a red box with a biohazard sign on it than a Coke can that has dirty needles. Good point. Pests and other nasties. So in terms of diseases, poisons, insects, chemicals, and medications, again, many of these have fact sheets that are listed uh, at the website. And you can get more detailed information. And of course, um, you can email uh, me at extension, and I can get the information to you as well. So farm visitors. I don't know who let this lady on the farm, but she obviously is not very good with cows. She's afraid of it. And then you have teachable moments. And here is a picture of a group of students working with llamas. And they're safely behind a fence. The visitors are on the outside. And they're getting instruction on how to be with the llamas in a safe way. And new babies are incredibly cute. And all farm visitors want to see the new little lambs. They want to see the new little calves. Uh, but they're incredibly dangerous. And this is a picture of cow behavior. And what they're doing is they're circling around the mother. They're pointing outward. And the cow that's looking right at you, one ear forward and one ear back, is looking in a, in a danger stance. And, and um, it can be likely that an agitated brand new mother cow could charge you. So if you have visitors on the farm that don't really understand or know animal behavior, you really want to make sure that they're supervised, particularly if you have mothers with new babies. Dogs, one of my favorite topics. So if you look at this picture, there are actually two dogs on the roof. And when you have people to your farm and you have dogs, um, Dogs can pose an issue because not all people like dogs, and, and not all dogs are particularly friendly. So these guys that were on the roof, it was a good thing they were there because these guys actually chase um, runners and bicyclists. And so um, if I'm coming to this farm, um, I always check to see where these particular dogs are. Some folks have working dogs on their farms, like a Moranus, which is a, a type of a, a shepherding dog, a guard dog. And they're great for keeping coyotes out of your sheep pasture, but they might also be aggressive towards farm visitors. Or they might simply bark a lot, which might upset the neighbors. Uh, so again, many dogs are fine around people, but not all people are fine around dogs. So you want to really uh, take take stock in terms of um, if your pet is able to run loose on the farm and if you have visitors. So yeah, farm visitors. I always think it's probably, uh, if you have dogs and visitors, it's best to keep one or the other um, penned up. Exactly. Just for for liability reasons, if nothing else. Exactly. So farm visitors, where are they authorized to be? Clear signs, rules around the animals, rules around the farmstead. No unsupervised visitor policy. Children on the farm, these are the last few slides. Um, children take pride in what they do. This is Carson. Again, he was the little boy in front of the tractor. And Carson is a uh, fourth, fifth generation maple sugarer. And he's there with his grandpa. And he is learning from his parents and his grandparents what to do. So the question is, is it age appropriate? So dad's stoking um, the fire here. And Carson's got a little saw. And he's practicing sawing in the background well away from um, the danger of the fire. And if you teach the adult, the child will reinforce 
the lesson. So in this picture, we were talking about uh, hydraulic fuel leaks and uh, talking to uh, the adult about PTO shafts and fuel leaks and hydraulics and uh, tractor safety basics. And all the kids went home and started to become the little safety monitors of tractors in their own home <laughs> and razzing their, their, their parents about the behavior if the parents' behavior wasn't being safe. So um, it's, sometimes it's good to teach the adult and the kids listen in and they feel like they're learning little nuggets and then they'll reinforce it for the adults. So to summarize with kids on the farm, children will mimic what you do on the farm. So if you have bad habits and you take shortcuts and safety shortcuts, kids will do it too. Age appropriate tasks. Don't give a five-year-old something a 10-year-old should do. Don't give a 10-year-old something a 20-year-old should do. Time appropriate lessons and child restricted areas. And that is the end of it. Terrific. Well, I've made a few notes and I have a few questions and a few things to, to chat with you about. So can okay. I take a few minutes to do that? All righty. So, well, the first thing was a, a personal, um, sort of a personal pet uh, soapbox for me is skin protection. So I was delighted that you uh, had uh, talked about skin cancer. And I just want to remind folks to please always um, make sure that you have the appropriate uh, SPF factor on. And remember that when it's hot and it's sweaty, you have to reapply it fairly often. Absolutely. Because the sun will do a number on your skin. And a farmer's tan might look nice, but underneath that, you're going to be growing potential cancer. So um, think about the health versus the fashion. Right. And speaking of fashion, the other thing I was going to say is about uh, personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that you have it sized for you. I have seen many farms where people are just running out to the barn just for a quick minute and they put on somebody else's boots that don't fit well mm -hmm. um, or grab somebody else's shirt and the sleeves are hanging down. Yep. That seems like a real safety disaster waiting to happen. Is that right? Well, uh, I have done that on occasion, um, so I'm guilty of it. Um, we used to keep various pairs of boots for visitors in case they didn't have boots. And occasionally, um, I would take a larger pair. And I have fallen more than once in a pair of shoes that was the wrong shoe for what I was doing. Um, and also, uh, loose clothes when you're working with machinery um, is, is really can be very, very deadly. It can, it can draw you in to, to something that's turning very quickly. Yeah. Um, and hair. So Make sure your hair is yep. under Absolutely. control, not loose hanging down. And the, and the other thing is that um, the hearing, the hearing thing is really important to talk about just really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the decimal level of tractors running, um, the exposure should be about 15 minutes when uh, a, a tractor is running full bore without ear protection. So if you start to have damage after about 15 minutes on a fully revved tractor, imagine somebody sitting there for five hours. So um, doing the ear protection having the kids use ear protection is so important to start from the very beginning because when you start losing your hearing when you're older, you can't get it back. But you can prevent hearing loss from wearing appropriate ear protection for the loud sounds that are on a farm. That, yeah, that's an important tip because I have a friend who's an audiologist and he would be the first to say that hearing loss is cumulative. So, you know, those silly mistakes that we all make when we're 18, they catch up to us when we're 68. Although I think that if I gave my kid a pair of um, earbuds when she goes to a concert, it wouldn't fly. But it <laughs> might fly. It might fly when she's on the farm. So we use we use we use them on my farm. So yes, I, I have a big box of disposable ones around her, even just for lawn mowing and mm -hmm. chipping, shredding things, chores around the house. And and the other thing about kids and ear protection, a Walkman does not count, or or a, an iPod. Uh -huh. I just dated myself by saying yeah. Walkman, sorry. Um, iPods don't count as ear protection, the little MP3 players. So, yeah, yeah that, that's a good point. That, doesn't, that may do more damage than help. 
Right. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about quickly is when you were talking about cleaning up all those old sheds and things. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say, say a few words about safe disposal of all these toxics. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the junk piles have various things in them that can be sorted out. And if you go to any of your regional solid waste districts, you can get a list of hazardous materials. And I know that in Lamoille County, we're having hazardous material collection day where you can bring in your questionable hazardous materials and your known hazardous materials, and they will take it. So you want to check to see when your solid waste district is uh, going to be a hazardous materials collection. Uh, you want to go to the solid waste district and get a listing of hazardous materials, um, what can be taken to the transfer station, and what needs to be um, disposed of differently. There is a, uh, a link to hazardous materials listing and how to dispose of it and how to uh, care f um, take care of your hazardous materials so that they are safe when they're still being used on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, fertilizers and, and gases and welding equipment and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, Great, thanks. Because and, and I know nobody listening to this would ever do that, but please don't ever just dump something on the ground to get rid of it. No. Check and see what the Keep proper disposal technique is. Yep. Keep your watershed safe. So, and speaking of of those chemicals as well, I just also wanted to remind people that when you're getting ready to do this cleanup, don't mix chemicals because that can be a recipe for disaster as well. That can. Uh, ammonia and bleach, uh, very toxic gases. And be mindful. Um, and you know what? All of these things have, have labels on them. And it's a good idea to keep the chemicals uh, the toxins um, in the original container. Don't transfer them into a Coke can or an old paint can. Uh, keep them in the original container and keep the labels on them so you know, three or four years down the road you know what was in there and you'll know how to dispose of it. Mm -hmm. So, and you mentioned um, petting zoos or petting animal oh. petting areas and things and I'm actually not a fan of those on farms for a lot of reasons but not the least of which is liability and um, um, sanitation for both the animals and the, and the, the humans. Um, but if you were going to have an area where these animals are, do you have any that you, you know, sort of any tips to recommend how people sort of let kids have some interaction with animals safely? Um, well. I would often bring my sheep to fairs or to demonstrations or to, to Tunbridge. Um, I would have people come to my farm. I had an area where the animals were uh, able to move about freely or if they were penned, um, I would stand um, with the animal to kind of protect the animal from reaching and grabbing thrusting hands um, that might have cotton candy in them or something else. Um, Generally, you have to supervise at all times and assume that the people are coming to see animals that they don't have the same knowledge base that you have. And so um, what I did at my farm was I had a specific area where people could see them and I had specific animals they could see. They would not be um, in and around my ram, for example. That mm -hmm. would not be the safest idea. I might have one or two lambs um, that I would bring out and occasionally I would bring the lambs to, to, to maybe a nursing home or something. But these are lambs that I would make sure their hooves were treated um, before they left the farm and before they came back onto the farm. Um, and you can treat animals' hooves um, in, in um, zinc to prevent things like foot rot. Um, so I think the basic rule is you're right, it's a liability issue. Um, if you're going to have a lot of visitors, you might want to think about a liability waiver. Um, if you're having field trips come, you want to make sure that there are permission slips that have a disclaimer saying that there are live animals. And you always want to go over the rules before the people get too close to the animals. Mm -hmm. How to approach an animal, uh, what you can and can't feed it, and, and, and often limit the amount of people um, or the amount of exposure that the animals have to people because they can get really agitated if there's just too much activity. Mm -hmm. And I would add, make sure that you have enough family members or employees around because uh, the one thing you should never do is assume that a visitor will follow the rules. That's exactly if there's right. a place that they're not supposed to be, they have an uncanny way of getting there. 
That's um, right. Don't just leave them unsupervised. And that brings me back to signs. If you're going to have people on your farm, you should have signs of authorized personnel only, please keep out, park here. So your signs should indicate and be clear. And if you have signs that are up, you've stated where people can and can't go. So it's one way to keep, uh, to reduce the liability. But uh, it also helps uh, the public know where they're allowed to be and where they're not allowed to be. Great. And particularly around areas like uh, manure lagoons, ponds, things like that. Um, I know you mentioned the importance of having fencing. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's important to make sure that it's adequate fencing. I think one strand of wire with the electricity turned off doesn't necessarily um, do the trick. Mm -hmm. I would, I would agree with that. I think appropriate fencing. Um, I think you need to be checking your fencing all the time. Um, Sheep in particular will get out of the fence whenever you least want them to do it. And your neighbors <laughs> will call you when you're least apt to be able to get home to say, your sheep are out. Um, it happens. It happens You know, to the best fences. Critters somehow manage to always get out. So um, make best efforts to have the appropriate fencing. Make sure that the electric is uh, put in properly. If you have a, um, a constant um, or an electric box for an electric fence, if you have a solar box, you want to make sure the grass is trimmed under the fence so that, um, the, so that the fence doesn't short out and the animals take off. Um, in the summer, in particular, if you have portable netting fence and, uh, and the grass is growing very quickly, all of that grass touching the bottom electric of that portable fence will ground it out, and then your fence really isn't working. So you want to be mindful of all of those things. Ticker. There's so many so, safety things. We could do this forever, Mary. I was just going to say, Alex, I can tell already I'm going to have you back to do a follow-up here, because I think we've got a bunch of different issues here that we've only touched the surface of. Um, but um, just in closing, I, I do want to remind folks that we do do these uh, once a month, and it's always on the uh, second Thursday. And we've got some great topics coming up, um, even through the summer. So I hope folks will be able to take some time. And again, the recordings are available on the website. So if you miss it, you can watch them. Um, or I hope you'll get your kids together and make them sit down and watch this as well, because I think there's some valuable tips. Um, just two quick things that you all could do uh, tomorrow. Um, and they, one is um, just, of course, get your first aid kit out and make sure, take a look at it, see how old it is, replace things, stock it up for the season. Uh, make sure you've got some creams and some bandages and that's ready to go and get it in a place where people can see it. And um, I don't know, Alex, do we have a, a first aid kit list somewhere? Or? I can, I can uh, get that link to you. Okay. And then the other thing, which is one of the very smartest uh, tips that I ever got at a safety training, and you can again do this tomorrow, is uh, write out the directions to your farm and post it near every single telephone and post it near the barn. Where some, because if there is an accident and you need to call for help, um, if you're in a panic or if, heaven forbid, you're the one that's hurt and it's a visitor that's trying to make a phone call, they're not going to be able to tell the emergency services where to come. That's true, uh, particularly if you're using just cell phones. Um, and, and not a standard landline. And, and a lot of people now are just going right to cell phones. So it's very important because 911 can't always find you on a cell phone. So that's something that you can do, and it will make you feel like you've accomplished something. Um, any other final words, Alex, before we well, call it out okay. night? Yeah, I want to give a pitch to the AgriBility Program. The Vermont AgriBility Program helps farmers with disabilities keep farming by providing um, education and technical assistance. Um, I work as the farm safety outreach person, and I can go to farms and help prevent accidents. Um, and if you are a farmer with a disability, uh, it can be a physical disability. It can be um, an injury that you're recovering from, and you'd like some assistance on how to be able to farm uh, in spite of or with your disability or your injury, please give us a call, uh, Vermont Agribility Project. Terrific. Now, how are they going to find me, Mary? Because where is my contact information? Will it be listed someplace? We will put it right on the, um, right on the website. 
your email, a link with your email address and your, the office phone number. How's that? That's terrific. I thank you for that. Okay. Well, and I thank you very much for giving up an hour this evening for a nice, nice spring evening. Well, thank you. It's actually been a lot of fun. Good, good. I think we covered some important points, but I, I can see already that there's room for a couple more shows here, so we'll have you back. Okay, thank you so and much. And I'll do better on my quizzes next time. I'm not going to have the rocks as much next time, Mary. It'll be, okay. it'll be, a, new, it'll be a new hardwood. But I'm glad, uh -oh. you, I'm glad you're using that as your takeaway, the rocks. Yay. Yay. Okay, great. Well, good night, everybody. Alex, thank you so much, and um, we'll see you all next month. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. -bye,